Thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar, Cyber Exemption Filing. Today's webinar is being presented with the support of Big Eye New York. Before I introduce our two speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with any colleagues. We also invite your comments and questions. Please look at the Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it in there and we will hold it for the discussion portion at the end of the event. Today's presenters are Christine Neat, AVP of Member Engagement and Tim Dodge, AVP of Research and Information. At this time, I'm going to hand the floor over to Tim Dodge, who is going to start today's presentation. Tim, it's all yours. Thanks, Ashley. And Christine, I know you want to chime in here too. I know we wanted to do this kind of conversational style. Um, I'll just start off with basic requirements because they really, they've been pretty consistent. They, you know, the cyber regulation took effect five years ago, five years on March 1st. Um, the, as far as the filing requirements go, they've not changed. The only thing that has changed, frankly, is that um, a couple of years ago, the department moved back the deadline for submitting the certification of compliance. It used to be February 15th. Now it's April 15th. And during the first pandemic year, they pushed it back even further than that temporarily. But, um, but you know, to, to summarize the requirements, the, every covered entity, and that would include every insurance agency, um, has to submit a certification of compliance on the department's website by April 15th. It's a, it takes five minutes to fill out. It's a simple form. You check a few boxes indicating that you're in compliance with regulation. It's all is totally on our system. They don't require any documentation at at this point. They they, they reserve the right to ask for it at any time. But um, it's basically the agency principal or somebody else within the agency filling out the form on the department's website saying yes, we're in compliance. In it's important to know that individual staff members who are licensed you do not have to do this because they are covered by the agency's uh, cybersecurity program. So they are exempt from having to file that form. Question we get a lot, do my individual employees have to file? No, they don't. Um, the, the other filing that people commonly think of and, and actually refer to it in the introduction is the exemption filing. For most people and organizations, the exemption filing is a one-shot deal. The uh, agency, if you qualify for any of the exemptions, uh, the agency in 2017 and then unfortunately again in uh, 2019 because of a technological change at the department had to go on the, the same portal on the department's website and fill out the form for the notice of exemption. What that form does is it tells the department's computer system that this license number is at least partially exempt from some of the requirements. Um, but the agency, unless, um, unless you become extremely successful and grow to the point where you have more than uh, 10 employees in New York and you have more than 5 million in New York revenue and you have more than 10 million gross assets. And if you've grown to that point, congratulations. Uh, but unless you've reached that stage, the agency should never have to do that filing again. Uh, individual uh, people with licenses and their personal names. If they, um, if they don't experience any sort of life change, they probably don't have to do it again. The only time uh, uh, somebody with a personal license would need to resubmit the, uh, the notice of exemption is most commonly if they change employers. Because when you, sub when you fill out that form on the department's website, you're saying, I'm exempt from this regulation because I'm covered by my employer's cybersecurity program. Department's computer then says, that's cool. What's the name of your employer? Who's, whose program covers you? And then you fill that information in. Well, if you change jobs, if you go from agency X to agency Y, that information has changed. And uh, regulation does require anyone who, once they become aware that they qualify for an exemption, they've got 30 days to submit that notice. So if somebody has changed jobs, you've hired somebody new, they should go on sometime within the first 30 days and redo that notice of exemption so they put in the information about their new employer. Uh, the regulation doesn't say this, but I always say, you know, if you've had a name change, change in durable status or something like that, probably, and, and so the name on your license has changed, it's probably not a bad idea to redo the, the notice of exemption again, uh, just so that the name on the notice of exemption matches up with, um, with the name on the license. I mean, the, the department's computer system tracks compliance by license number, so it's probably not strictly necessary, but it takes two minutes and it's probably not a bad thing. Tim, if I if I change jobs, 
-hmm. So I have to go in on the cyber and I have to say who I'm now covered underneath. Yep. Is does that automatically change too on my license or are those two separate two yep, separate so things totally that I have to documents. do? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. The, yeah, the, the light the license is one document, the notice of exemption is totally separate. They're, they're probably on different systems. <laughs> Uh, so I would have to go in to to where I go in and renew my license. I'd go in there and I'd change it now and say that I'm working for the ABC Insurance Agency. And then I would go in the cyber and I would also do a filing there as well. Okay. Well, yeah, because when you when, whenever you fill out a license application, whether it's a new license or a renewal, it does ask for both a residential and a business address. And obviously, if you change employers, your business address is changed, at least in theory, with so many of us working remotely. Practically mm -hmm. speaking, you probably haven't. Um, but but yeah, when you renew the license, you've got to provide your current business address. And if that's changed, you need to update that. And um, um, and actually, by law, whenever you have a change of address, whether you move uh, or or if your um, uh, the the license, your principal uh, address on the license, you know, when you fill out the application, it's going to ask where do you want communication sent. Um, if you change jobs and you, know, and, you, and you gave your employer's address as your principal address, and you got 30 days to make that change. That, that's actually a requirement in New York law. So yeah, go in, change the address on your license, and then do the cybersecurity change. Um, it sounds like a hassle between the two of them. It shouldn't take more than five, 10 minutes at the outside. Okay, great. It's pretty quick then. Okay, so <clears throat> I would go in and then, so I'm filing the exemption and I filed the exemption for the entity. And then each year for the certification of compliance, do I do it on an individual basis or does it only being done by my employer? How does that work? Certification of compliance applies only to the business. So if, if the, well, let me put it this way. And this is where people got tripped up. Okay. The notice of exemption form did not be most user-friendly things, not the way I would have designed it. Um, um, so consequently, more than a few people probably completed it incorrectly. Uh, so when you when you ask why you're exempt, it brings up a bunch of numbers, 500.19A and B and C and D and, and Z and whatever. Um, that's great if you're familiar with the various sections of the regulation, and I've lived this regulation for five years, so I, uh, you know, I can recite them in my sleep. Most of you have lives and, and can't do that. Uh, so what happened is some people check the wrong boxes on that thing. And so if, uh, if you check any box other than 500.19B, the department's computer system is going to be looking for a certification of compliance from your license number. And that consequently, we had episodes, not so much last year, but the year before, a lot of people getting emails from the department saying, um, we haven't gotten your certification yet. Um, and it's because when people file the notice of exemption, they probably check A1, 2, and 3, and they really needed to leave those blank and just check box B. Box B tells the computer system, this person works for somebody else. They don't have to do the certification and compliance. So if you check the right box on your notice of exemption, and I know the next question is going to be, how do I find out what box I check? The answer is there is no good way to find that out. But if you check box B on the notice of exemption, the department's computer system will not expect to see a certification of compliance associated with that license number. So generally speaking, individuals never have to do that. So if I'm not sure what I did and I'm kind of, you know, a little nervous or a little confused, or if I get something from the DFS asking me to do with the certification of compliance, and I'm actually covered by my employer's um, you know, policies and procedures, yeah. then I should probably go in and refile under 500.19B because yeah. it doesn't hurt for me to refile again. You, you can hurt. always go in and, and, and submit a revised notice of exemption. Uh, okay. That's what you would do if you change jobs. I mean, there's already a notice of exemption associated with your license number. So if you, if you move to a different agency, um, you're gonna go in and submit a revised notice of exemption, putting in the updated information. And anybody at any time, if they're not sure that they submitted the right thing, and uh, that, that's true in a lot of cases. Yeah. And if, if any of you are sitting here listening to this thinking, geez, I might have done that, you've got a lot of company <laughs> all over the state and, and all over the country because uh, this, you know, this applies to New York non residents as well. So if you're not sure that you did the right thing, just take the five minutes, go back in and uh, 
and, and complete a, a revised notice of exemption. Make sure you check the right box. And by the way, there's detailed step-by-step -step instructions on the Big Eye New York website. There's also instructions on the DFS website. If you go to the DFS homepage, dfs.ny.gov, uh, you'll see a link there for cybersecurity resources. Click that link, it brings you up to a page with, with links to everything they've got on it, including instructions on how to submit the notice of exemption and how to submit the certification of compliance. So there's, there's a lot of help out there for people who aren't sure how to do it. So people, some people were putting something in the chat box and they just wanted to know for an individual filing, um, it's B is in boy. It's the fourth one down. It's 500. Yep. Yeah, yep. 500.19 so B is in boy. Yeah, so 500.19 A, you can tell by the nature of the choices that it's referring to a business because 500.19 A refers to the number of employees you have. And 519, or I'm sorry, A1 refers to the number of employees. A2 refers to what your New York revenue is. And A3 refers to your gross assets. I mean, those are those would imply you know, that they, they apply to a business. 500.19B, and I don't have the language in front of me here, so I'm going to paraphrase, but basically ask, are you an employee, designee, agent, or uh, representative of another candidate entity that has the cybersecurity program? That's the box you want to check if you're an employee, because that's true. I work for whatever agency in Suffolk County, uh, so I'm covered by their cybersecurity program. Because, because the regulation says if you... Uh, are fall into one of those categories, employee, agent, designee, representative of a covered entity that has a cybersecurity program, it says flat out, you're not required to have one. So then you check that box B, and that tells the department's computer system, again, this license number is not required to have a cybersecurity program. We should not look for a certification of compliance for that license number. So it's really important that you check that box and only that box when you do the notes of exemption. So yeah, it's D as in boy, baseball, basketball, whatever you want to say. Um, and then we have another question from somebody that said, so basically, if I don't receive any notification from the DFS, then I don't need to complete this? So if, if by this, the person means the certification of compliance, I would say yes, that's accurate. And that's, um, a, that's on an individual basis, that's not on, on an individual an... basis. I, businesses every year between January 1st and April 15th have to submit that certification of compliance uh, unless... This regulation gets repealed, which I highly doubt. <laughs> There's absolutely no movement in that direction. This is a permanent requirement. Businesses have to do this every year by April 15th. And it's not just agencies, it's carriers, it's banks, it's credit unions, it's any financial services company doing business in the state of New York. Good. So Tim, I'm thinking about retiring in the next few months. I got but... that more than one person on this call right now is also having the same thoughts after listening to me talk. <laughs> so I'm thinking about retiring in the next few months, but I may keep my license because I want to work for WAVE. Um, what do I have to do? What do I do in that situation? Yeah, there and the language in the regulation is kind of convoluted here because um, there is a, a separate exemption. It falls under paragraph 500.19C. And... I want to assure you people, I really do have a life, but I'm just sitting around memorizing sections of regulations. But 500.19C applies to, first thing I want to say is the, the regulation uses the phrase covered entity to refer to anybody who has obligations under this regulation. So when it uses the phrase covered entity, it doesn't just mean a business entity, it also means a person. So if you are a covered entity um, who doesn't have an information system, doesn't store any personal information, but you still have a license, so you're still covered by the regulation. You are still required to do a risk assessment. If you don't have any of those things, that risk assessment shouldn't take you more than like 30 seconds or so. Um, if for some reason you have personal information that third parties have access to, you've got to have policies and procedures for that. Again, seems unlikely. And you, you have to do the annual filing. Uh, with, with the department. So if, you, if you're a retiree, or sometimes you get people who have um, left the industry for some period, but they still have the license in the force. Maybe they, um, uh, make, you know, maybe they stop working and have children, or maybe they're just between jobs. Um, you know, we're, we're going through what they call the great resignation. Some people are just taking time off. So if you're in that situation where you don't have an employer, but you still have a license, you still have to do that certification and compliance. And again, there's not much to comply with when you're in that situation because you're just not handling people's private information. And 
I mean, the regulation requires you to protect your own computer network and re requires you to protect people's private information. And if you're not currently working in insurance, there's just not a whole lot to protect there. So the, I'm not quite sure why the department put this requirement in there, but that's the way it reads right now. So if, if you have a license and you're retired, um, you would fall under 5019C and you would need to submit the certification of compliance in that situation. Okay. Um, I also, we also have somebody that has two licensed entities at the same mm -hmm. location. So they're doing business under two separate names. They use, let's say uh, they use the same agency management system. Um, how do they, how do they do? How did they file their exemption? How do they do a certification of compliance? Can you expand upon that? Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's tracked entirely by license number. So if those two entities have separate license numbers, those two entities have to do separate filings. As far as the DFS computer, computer system is concerned, we are talking about two different entities here, two different licensees. They track it all by license number. So if entity A has, A has one license number and entity B has another one, both entities have to do separate notice of exemption, which hopefully they did three years ago. And uh, they both entities have to log in every year and, and submit that certification compliance. It's, even if they're sharing the same agency management system, if they got different license numbers, we're talking different filings. Okay. Um, it says, what about if you were a sub-licensee for the agency, would they have to file each year themselves to fall underneath the owner's coverage? No, again, individuals uh, do not. As a matter of fact, if you're a sub-licensee, then your license number actually is the, the agency's license number. You don't even have to have a license in your personal name to be a sub-licensee in New York. That's not the case in all states, but it is in New York. Um, so if you're a sub-licensee and that's the only license you've got, uh, that, that annual filing for the agency is the only thing you've got to worry about. If you have a license in your personal name, in addition to being a sub-licensee on the agency's name, then again, you should file, you should have filed the notice of exemption saying that I'm an employee or an agent or a designee of the uh, covered entity. And then that would have been all you would have to do. Again, you wouldn't have to worry about it again unless you change the employers. So we have another question that says, so an individual does not need to file an exemption every year if they have not changed jobs. And the answer yes. to that is that is correct. That is, is correct. It, if, if, if you, if you um, had worked at the same place for five years and you haven't changed your name, there's no reason to revisit it. Unless, again, you're not sure that you checked the right box. Right. Uh, and it's but really there's good. certainly no requirement, there's, I will say this, there's no requirement in the regulation that people go in and redo the notice of exception every year. It's just not in there. And, and probably too is, is that once somebody does it or, um, you know, files for your exemption, or you do your certification of compliance, which we'll get into in one minute. But what you should do is, is when you get to the last page, you know, it will say submit, you get to swear. And we like that last part after filling all of that out, you yep, get to swear and then you get to, thing. yep. And then you get to submit. And one of the really great things is that you really should do at that point is you should print off that page because that page actually tells you how did you really file for it? It tells you what you picked. It gives you your receipt number as well. You will receive an email from the DFS confirming yeah. that you've done that. However, it doesn't show how you filed. So once you actually do your exemption, it's a good thing to pay, uh, print off that last page because it will give you that. Whatever so, filing you're doing, notice of exemption, certification compliance, I always encourage people to either save that last screen as a PDF or print it out for your records because there have been times when people call up and said, I did the certification compliance. I'm looking at the receipt right here. It's got a number on it. And say, okay, write back to the department providing that receipt number and asking what you should do. And they will then check their records and say, well, something was checked wrong or something like that, or, they, or you may never hear from them. You know, that it, they're working with computers and anybody on this call who's worked with computers know that they sometimes go haywire and, and that happens with their department system as well as ours. So once we go in and we file for our, you know, limited exemption for the covered entity, the employer mm -hmm. goes in and they do that. Every year they have to go in and they have to file a certification of compliance and they have to file that between January 1st and what what's the? April 15th. 
April 15th. So yep. they go just, in. Just, just, just think tax day. You got to submit your taxes and you got to have your certification of compliance by that. Oh, that's right. Because it's oh, it's like your taxes where you're certifying for the previous year. And that's yeah. why that box is grayed out and I can never change that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. When, when the agency goes in to, to fill out the form for the certification of compliance, it'll ask what year you're certifying for and you can't change it. <laughs> if you go in today, it'll say 2021. And that's a box you cannot edit. So oh. yeah, it's exactly right there. And and to be honest, I mean, the department moved the deadline from February 15th to April 15th, we suspect, in order to increase compliance. They were finding a lot of people were not getting their certifications in. So let's give them another couple extra months to get it done, have it coincide with the tax deadline, and maybe it'll be easier for people to remember. Um, but yeah, it's always for the previous year. So pretty much when I need to, when I go in and do my certification of compliance, I'm going to need my corporate license number, just the numeric part, and yeah. I'm going to need my uh, federal ID number, my FIN number. No, um, so it's going to ask, uh, when, you, when you sign into the system to fill this thing out, it's going to ask, how do you, how do you want us to look for your record? The, the, the first question is, mm -hmm. how do you want our system to look for your record? You can input the license number, you can put uh, ID number, that kind of thing. And the easiest thing, frankly, is to just type in the numeric portion of the license number. It'll come up. If you try typing in your name, all bets are off as to whether it's going to find it. Because I remember getting a call from uh, a member once, and I'm for, I'm blanking on the exact name, but it was something like George S. Thompson and Sons or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the um, person is doing a search on the name, and it's not coming up, and it's not coming up. And so finally, I went to do a search on the department's website for their license record and saw that the department's record had it as Thompson, George S. and Sons. So that's, that's why searching by name can be a fraught proposition. Much easier to just type in the numeric portion of the license. You don't have to type in the PC dash or BR dash or whatever the prefix happens to be. Just type in the numeric portion and it, it'll come up. Right, but when I do but my certification of my compliance, I do right. need my federal ID number that I put that in because they asked me for my federal ID number and yeah. it's a pretty quick process, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like takes That's, like three minutes. Yeah. And the other thing is it's going to ask who made the determination that you're in compliance. Um, that question is more relevant for large organizations like carriers and banks who have staffs of hundreds and probably have their own IT department or something like that. For a seven person insurance agency, which makes up the vast majority of Big Eye New York members, the person who made the determination that they're in compliance is probably the boss, probably the owner of the agency. So just put that name down. Matter of fact, what you do when, when you fill out that form, you spend more time filling in contact information than anything else because the first screen is going to ask, who made the determination? Okay, give us that person's name, their title, their email address, their phone number, all of this stuff. And then uh, you have to put in a date that you made that determination, I just tell people to use the date they're filling out the form. So if you're doing it today, put in February 24th. And then on the next screen, it's gonna say, ask for the name of the person completing the form. Eight times out of 10 is the same person who made the determination. So you fill in your name and your email address and your phone number a second time. And then you check the box saying, I swear to God, I'm telling the truth. And that's pretty much it. Okay, we got a couple more questions, um, okay. Tim, is, is what happens if you miss the uh, filing date of April 15th? You know, what happens if you miss that certification for one year? Do they allow late filings for a year that was missed? How does that work? Well, I will say this, um, if, you, if you suspect that you forgot, um, whether it's April or August, I would encourage you to go in and, and do it. Um, could there potentially be a disciplinary action for filing the notice late? Yeah, there could be. I have not heard of that happening to anybody yet. Um, if you go on the department's website, the big enforcement actions, frankly, against uh, anybody for non-compliance with cyber regulation have been against insurance companies and banks. I've yet to see, and, and the department publishes a disciplinary action report on its website at the end of every month. There should be one coming out next week. Uh, listing disciplinary actions against both carriers and agents and claim adjusters and anybody who has a license. Um, we're, all, we're coming up on the five-year anniversary of this regulation. Still have not seen any agent get fined uh, for failing to comply with the cyber regulation. I see a lot more for people forgetting to mention on their renewal applications that they're being investigated by the state of Alabama or something like that. 
Um, so I can't sit here and tell you that you will never get time for filing a late notice. I'm just saying it hasn't happened yet. And it's probably given the vast number of licenses and entities that are covered by this regulation, I suspect that it's further down the department's priority list, given the resources that they have for enforcement. Okay, and then we do have one more question is, is that, um, do we have, do we know about any companies that have been fined under this law and why they were fined? Do, do you have any information on that? Hold on, let me pull up the department's well because they, they've issued big press releases when they've done this. And again, the, the big, the, there was a title, uh, title insurance company and I want to say a bank. Let me just go there real quick. And they were for large amounts of money, but it's telling me that I can't. So when um, when Tim's looking that up, another great resource is if you go to BigIny.org, and you actually go online. We actually have a research resource center. And we have a whole kit on there that will walk you through step by step on how you can do these individual filings, as well as how you can do um, the certification of compliance. There's policies and procedures in there. So what you would do is you go to BigIny.org, you go to discover, then there's another section, it's answer center. And then when you go down to the answer center, you can go to cybersecurity and there's a whole kit of information in there and resources that you can use. And what we'll do is, is after this meeting, Gene will actually send everybody a survey. And what we can do is, is we can put the link in there. So if you have any questions, you can go there and you can, um, you know, find the information that you're looking for as well. So we can share that out. Yeah, we have a little technical problem on my workstation here. So I'm actually going to look up the department's website on my phone. And they, they, they've only issued a handful of releases on this, but when, when they've taken action against uh, a carrier that made quite a big news release about it. So here we go here. There's not, just so you know, I looked it up. Um, it was issued on February 2nd, 2022. Um, you know, there's just a couple of agents. Oh, the oh, the, the latest uh, disciplinary action report? Yeah, I just looked up disciplinary um, action and it says in New York State Department of Financial Services takes disciplinary action against licensees or registrations, registrants under the law. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So that's the report I was referring to. It comes out. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's always dated the end of the month, but it doesn't actually show up on their website until the beginning of the next month. Um, so sometime around March 2nd or 3rd or something like that, you should see um, a new report. But if you look at that report, a lot of the enforcement actions against agents and brokers are things like, again, uh, you, you didn't disclose that you were subject to a disciplinary action in another state, or uh, you commingled your operating and premium accounts, things like that. Still haven't seen any uh, actions against agents for uh, cyber yeah, there's only a few listed here and nothing is cyber. Yeah. I'm just scrolling through here, their list of news releases to see. Um, it seemed like they did one. That, um, they, they took some big action summer before last and we actually reported that on our website. Uh, and they, again, they were against carriers. carriers. And against what, they, what they were was people, actually, okay, I don't remember the exact details, but there were a couple of instances where a um, entity actually suffered a cyber breach and didn't report it. And actually the department found out about the cyber breach just doing a routine audit of that entity. And I want, I want to say it wasn't even an insurance carrier, it may have been a bank. Um, so, uh, you know, because the regulation requires you to report a breach within 72 hours of you figuring out that it's a breach that's going to significantly impact your business. And uh, this particular entity, this had gone on for a year and, um, and they had reported it. And in fact, DFS had to find it out on their own. So you can imagine that that particular entity wrote a rather sizable check. Um, if, if you want, I can send you a, a, a link to the, the news releases about that and you can share them with the group. Um, uh, Cause I, I don't want to tie up everybody's time while I scroll through the Harvard news releases. But there's, they've only publicly announced a handful of uh, actions. I want to say fewer than five. 
and they've been against large entities for things like that. Great. Well, I think I've answered, we've answered a lot of the questions that were posed to us. So I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, like I said, I mean, feel free to visit our website, or if you have any questions, you can call myself or you can call Tim and we can help you as well. Yeah, if you uh, go to bigguynewyork.org and sign in, it is member benefits, so is password protected. Uh, you'll see a link right on our homepage for cybersecurity. Click that and it'll bring you to the homepage for the cyber section. And everything we've got on this regulation is there, including the step-by-step -step instructions, templates for the cybersecurity uh, policies and procedures if you want to update, you know, a little cheat sheet about when you need to revisit your program. Um, spoiler alert, probably more often than you think. Um, so there's a lot of resources like that. I would really encourage you to make full use of that. Yep. And we will be sending out something tomorrow in our, in case you missed it too, by the way, about uh, multi-factor authentication. And why is multi-factor authentication, you know, important tool to have within your agency? Yeah, interesting thing that you bring that up because um, you're, if, you're, if, you, if your agency qualifies for the limited exemption, the regulation does not require you to implement multi-factor authentication. Nevertheless, every cybersecurity expert recommends that every entity, no matter how small, implement that. Um, because it's a very effective way to try and keep the bad guys out. Basically, it requires people to, and it's, it's like when you, log, if you've ever done online banking, when you log into your um, bank account, it may ask you, um, what was your mom's middle name? Um, and uh, it, that's multi-factor authentication. They're basically taking one extra step to verify that you are who you say you are. And if you do that, it makes it that much more difficult for hackers or anybody else with an illicit purpose to, to uh, get into your network. And people so, should also do multi-factor authentication on any websites that they use. You know, there's um, plenty of apps out there that allow you, um, for example, uh, if I wanna log on and make any changes to a website I manage, I have an app on my phone and I have to put in a six digit code and it changes every minute. Yep, so, yep. We, we you know, used to hear Big Eye New York for years. Um, I actually, um, um, even just to get into Microsoft Teams this morning, I had to put in multi-factor authentication. So we've got a lot of tools that are coming up, you know, a lot of webinars that are going to be coming up. We definitely, you know, ask you to, you know, watch our emails that are coming. We have some things on cyber. Tim's got something else that uh, he wants to share. I can see his finger I would going up. be absolutely remiss if I did not mention that we have a, our very first continuing education on demand course. And um, that is, if you've ever listened to a podcast or an audiobook, it's exactly the same format. Uh, it's one hour of listening to me talk, and then you take a 50 question exam, and if you pass the exam, you get two CE credits. And the first CE course is 10 things you need to know about the New York cybersecurity regulation. It's available now. You can, you can uh, purchase it anytime, and then you can listen to it. Uh, I've been told not to suggest that people listen to it in the car, although I know you're all going to, or at least it's you know, those of you who, who download it, but whatever you're doing, chores, walking the dog, exercising, whatever, if you've got nothing better to listen to during your workout, you can listen to me talk about cyber for an hour. It's an easy two credits. Yep. And we also do have one of our partners, Motiva, that we were introduced by our friends at Suffolk, you know, that will actually go in for part of your, it's, it's all included within your membership. They'll go in and they'll do an analysis on your, um, you know, on your agency to see if, you know, how you would work through an audit with the DFS. So they actually go in, they run a program and they'd be able to give you some, you know, feedback on um, your compliance issues with that. So uh, there'll be some information that we'll supply with Gene again, and we can share that with all of you. Yep. And by the way, Walter, uh, Walter Petreras at Motiva is one of those people who recommends that everybody have uh, multi-factor authentication. Yep. Whether, whether you buy it from him or not, he recommends that everybody have it. Yep. Great. Any other questions? Not seeing anything in the box. Me neither. Thank you, everyone. We're so we're so excited that you attended today. We're sorry we did go over a little a uh, little later than what we told you, but uh, Thank you, you know, we appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.